Where is our like zoom camera right here? That's again. Yeah. That, oh, yeah. That's yeah. Oh. That yeah. So it should it should be a little track you nice. follow you around. Nice. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Watch what he said even in the back. <laughs> yeah. Broke it. I think so. Good. Can everyone hear us in the Zoom? Yeah, thumbs up. Good. Well, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for coming. We have uh, a great session today. We have a Zoom crowd and an in-person crowd, so we'll try to speak to both. But I am Pete Miller. I'm a professor in the School of Education and working a lot with Maria and our whole team with this uh, BIOS initiative, which is our effort to bring great research together with top athletics. And on, on our campus, we have both. We have one of the best universities in the world with uh, world experts in all disciplines across campus. And on this side, on the athletic side, we have just some amazing uh, athletes, coaches, staff, and so many people. So we're trying to bring the two together in new and purposeful ways. And we've been doing that for about a year, a little over a year, and it's been a really great experience. So many of you have contributed in lots of great ways. And so today's session, we're super excited about. We've been looking forward to this um, for weeks and weeks. So we have uh, two of the leading experts on, as we'll see, on meditation, mindfulness practice in the athletic setting. And um, we've heard from Chad in the past, Chad, about uh, meditation as it relates to work with our teams here at UW-Madison. Chad's um, one kind of a path breaker, is that a word? Uh, trailblazer in many ways um, with his work that we've heard about, we're so excited to have. And then with Dr. Drew Watson um, coming together and studying what they're doing in new and meaningful ways. So thank you both so much for being here today and we're excited to learn from you. Sweet. Well, thank you. Uh, so couldn't be more excited to be here today. So as Drew said, Chad McGee, Director of Meditation Training for the Athletics Department. Uh, and I think what we're going to do today is, is pretty cool, pretty exciting sort of stuff. So this is the terrain that we're going to be covering today. Uh, we'll kind of talk a little bit about some of the collaboration between a practitioner and researcher. What does that look like? Um, and we'll spend most of our time talking about the findings from the research on the meditation training we've been doing here at Wisconsin Athletics. Uh, and then we'll spend some time as a group having a discussion on where do we go from here, both on the training and on the research side. So as Pete mentioned, and a big shout out to Pete and Maria for organizing, facilitating, creating BIOS, it's pretty inspirational stuff. And I feel like what we're doing with this work and talking about today is 100% in line with bringing together research and athletics. So uh, just a bit of background on, on me. Uh, so in this role that I have as director of meditation training, it's really helpful to think of it, I think, as a hybrid role. Uh, so a big bulk of my time is spent on training. This is with teams, with athletes. Uh, individually, whole team sort of stuff. But then part of the role is also dedicated to research. So actively engaged and empirically understanding what we're you know, learning as we investigate this sort of training. Uh, but I'm not a scientist. Uh, I've often thought that my job is to sit next to scientists and collaborate. Uh, so for six years, I was based at a group on campus here at UW called the Center for Healthy Minds, uh, where we kind of did investigations and in all sorts of you know, practices in, in different environments, law enforcement, education and athletics. Um, and then when I joined the athletic department uh, in this role, I really wanted to have research be a part of it, but I didn't know if that was just aspirational. Man, it'd be really great if we could do research and the work we're doing with meditation training in athletics. And I couldn't be happier, more excited, more proud that it is a reality, that we have evidence that we are able to publish on what we're doing in the work in athletics. Uh, and uh, because, of course, you know, part of what we're doing is we're trying to figure out what are the best ways to bring meditation training into these sorts of high performance environments. So those are questions that we have that we need answers for. So there's various sources of information for that. Some of that, of course, is more anecdotal. It's what players tell me. It's what coaches tell me. It's what I pick up on, like what I hear from collaborators in the athletic department. Uh, but we also need empirical evidence. And empirical evidence is not my expertise. That's not what I know how to do. So we need to collaborate. So in steps Drew and his lab to be able to collaborate to understand some of what we're understanding scientifically. Before I pass it to Drew, I got to give a shout out to Scott uh, in the room today, Scott Anderson getting his PhD in Drew's lab, uh, kind of 
foot in both worlds of athletics and research. And we would not be here today sharing what we're sharing if it weren't for Scott. So thank you, Scott. Uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm Drew Watson. I'm one of the primary care sports medicine physicians, which means that I take care of athletes here at Wisconsin. I also do a lot of research and specifically within the athletic department, this means I'm part of the Badger Athletic Performance Group, which is a handful of clinician scientists that are kind of trying to use research to drive clinical care, to drive research, to drive clinical care on a timeline that's much, much faster than what we can do in sort of traditional academic medicine. And I think what we'll talk about today is one of the better examples I have of that of the way that some of the things we're doing in the athletic department lend themselves to evaluating their effects. And that lends itself to trying to disseminate it more widely for the betterment of larger and larger groups of athletes. So hopefully that rings true, but that's really how Chad and I got connected and continue to try and reinforce the things we're seeing. Um, so I won't belabor this point, except that we're all, I think, aware that we're in the middle of a mental health epidemic. This existed before COVID, but COVID has compounded it. And so I, just to set a little bit of context, I try and show a brief piece of the data that we've collected around this. In the recent past, we've been doing a lot of work and looking at how COVID-19 has impacted mental health among athletes. This is some of the things that we've done in younger adolescent athletes, just kind of highlighting the changes from before COVID to early COVID during the shutdown and cancellation of sports and school, and then what they look like coming back. And basically we use this depression scale to try and quantify the degree of symptoms that athletes are having in terms of depression. And this, doesn't show up on the left there, is just sort of the historical level of symptoms. And I don't expect two to mean a lot. It's just intended to show that they went through the roof in early COVID-19. And that thankfully, as athletes are returning, we see that it comes down, but unfortunately not to where we were historically. So we're coming to terms with the fact that we're going to be seeing ripple effects in terms of mental health from a lot of what happened during COVID for years to come. Just to maybe make that a little more tangible, you could take the scale and turn it into clinical categories of depression. And for us as clinicians, we tend to look at moderate to severe levels of depression as those that require intervention and management. And if you look at the proportion of athletes, at least in Wisconsin, before COVID-19 that had that level of depression, it's about 5%. In early COVID, it was nearly 40%. So it had just really dramatically increased. Now the athletes that had returned to sports in the spring of 21, it had dropped back down, but again, not back to nearly the level we'd seen historically. So just to drive home the fact that this is going to be an issue for years to come, particularly as these athletes age up into college and older. We've been collecting quality of life data. So a little bit of a different endpoint, but sort of in the same broad area of mental health. We've been collecting quality of life data among our UW athletes for years. We generally do this about twice a year for most groups. And so we were able to look at how this kind of trends before and then during early COVID. The particular scale we use is measures both physical and mental quality of life. So we treat those kind of separately. Um, we had about 5,000 surveys that we looked at when we started analyzing this from nearly 2,000 total participants, about half of whom were women. So this is just showing like the average values of these things over time looking kind of pre-COVID and then during COVID. And it's, I think, kind of clear what sort of happens here, but if you really bucket these things together and just average everything before COVID and everything after, interestingly, the physical quality of life seemed to improve a little bit during COVID-19. The mental side though got worse overall. And I think this just parallels broader society, right? Athletes aren't exempted from what's going on in the rest of the world. We were seeing real issues around those kind of initial impacts of the shutdowns around COVID-19. If we tease this out by different groups, so we can look at this relatively speaking between males and females, and what we found was that female athletes seem to be disproportionately impacted along this mental side of quality of life to where male athletes didn't change a lot from pre to during COVID, but female athletes really seem to do markedly worse during COVID. Interestingly, we saw that individuals on individual team sports actually looked a little bit worse. It's purely speculative to try and talk about why these might be, but some indication that there may have been athletes kind of early in COVID who were particularly susceptible 
to the mental side of the impacts we saw. So that sort of is just background, right? What we really wanted to talk about was broadly speaking, how mindfulness and meditation play a role in athlete lives. And obviously Chad is the expert here, but in some ways to help ourselves be, feel more informed, Scott, who Chad pointed out earlier, and then Dr. Kristen Harrell's daughter, both of whom are in my lab with me, we all sort of got together and reviewed what we could find about mindfulness in athletics. And I'll keep returning to this just to highlight different points. But one of the big take homes we had around this is that there does seem to be evidence that mindfulness improves a lot of psychosocial outcomes in athletes. And this is not specific to collegiate levels. This is not specific to any particular age group. Just broadly speaking, there seems to be evidence that mindfulness moves the needle on a fair number of these outcomes. And this is not new to medicine in general. So even though mindfulness can seem a little bit on the fringe in some cases, it's actually been the focus of a lot of work in medicine for many years. And there are large randomized controlled trials that have demonstrated its efficacy for a whole lot of different endpoints, not just anxiety and depression, but even things like injury risk in athletes, illness risk, even potentially affecting things like post-surgical pain. So we're really just sort of building off a really well-established evidence base. Yeah. Is this on just an athlete or is this? No, this is everybody. Yeah, this is kind of all comers. So there are, there are things that are done in athletes like can't remember if we included in here or not, but there's been work looking at how it can reduce the in-season injury risk in athletes. This is kind of broadly like all comers. Um, yeah, so just zooming in, Chad will sort of point about all those things within athletics. Yeah, so I think Drew really set the stage nicely for kind of like the state of what's happening. Uh, and then meditation at Wisconsin Athletics, what is this? What are we doing here? So I think there's some you know, foundational things that would be helpful for us to get on the same page around. So one is the orientation of this work is strength and conditioning for the mind. Uh, I'm not a licensed mental health provider. Uh, of course, the overlap with that area of work, you know, is important uh, and there's a great collaboration there, but this is really embedded into normal training. So athletes might finish a lift and then we do a meditation together. Uh, the idea here is we're going to take folks, you know, from good to great, great to elite. We're not waiting for the mental game to work itself out. We're training to get better at it. Also, this work is situated in Wisconsin athletics and what we call Forward 360. So Forward 360 are kind of all the support groups at Wisconsin athletics that have direct contact with student athletes who aren't coaches. Uh, and there's a couple of key collaborators in there that I want to name. So one, clinical sports psychology. As I said, I'm not a licensed mental health provider. So we have very clear scope of practice. We have very clear kind of referral processes. And I think the work really amplifies and supports each other. We'll get into that. Another is strength and conditioning. So uh, strength and conditioning uh, is really important for a variety of reasons, including, you know, we kind of have a similar orientation in terms of training. Uh, so they're natural thought partners in where we're going. And also, of course, in college athletics, student athletes time is very well protected. So strength coaches oftentimes are the folks who are literally giving up some of their strength and conditioning time in order to do this work. Uh, another group that I wanna call out is sports medicine, you know, not only for the research collaborations that we're doing, but of course, sports medicine, athletic trainers in particular, have so much contact with student athletes. And it's such a trusted relationship to be able to kind of reinforce and refer from there are really important. So the work is situated not as an isolated department, but inside of a larger collaborative space. And of course, coaches are unbelievably important for this. So this work is optional. Uh, teams don't have to participate in this. So the work has to fit inside of a coach's philosophy. It has to make sense to them. They have to want to integrate it. And one of the things that I've seen happen is the spaces where this takes root for the longest amount of time is places where coaches whether they're sport coaches or people on staff have embodied experience with the practice, not just the idea of it, but they felt it and experienced it themselves and want to support it moving forward. So this is kind of like the big picture of some of the things we're doing with meditation training. And now I'm going to share a little bit about some of the specifics inside the training of what we're actually doing. So Drew's going to share in a moment, some of the findings uh, from what we saw. And what I want to be describing is the, the intervention or the training uh, that happened upon which we saw the results of the findings that Drew is going to share. So this is a foundational training. Uh, so in this training, uh, it can look a variety of ways, but typically it's kind of, we're uh, doing whole group trainings. 
Uh, so all the athletes are there. Oftentimes coaches are also present in that training. You know, about 30 minutes were the sessions. We had content that we covered together and then they had access to resources that they could continue to practice in between sessions. So the main content, we started with training attention. And of course, attention is foundational to everything. Training your attention to be where you want it to be is unbelievably important. Mindfulness, when we say mindfulness here, this word mindfulness gets tossed around in a lot of different ways. When we're talking about mindfulness, we're talking about the ability to observe what is happening externally and internally without getting swept away. So we can do practices to train in those qualities. And then we can do, we can practice things like attention and mindfulness. We can do it while we're still and we can do it while we're moving. And of course for athletes, they're moving a lot. So being able to incorporate these practices into movement practices is really important. And then we get into appreciation. So in the contemplative world, one of the frameworks that we have is we need to balance wisdom. We need to balance insight, things like attention and mindfulness with compassion. We need to balance it, not just seeing clearly, but doing it with a sense of warmth, right? So one of the ways that we do that in this work is by training appreciation. So training appreciation is simply noticing the good that is already there. It's not this kumbaya, pretending things are great when they're not. Uh, mindfulness allows us to see things clearly and appreciation allows us to notice the good that is happening because there's always going to be some level of good that is happening as well. And then in the fifth session, we get into what we might think of as insight. So the content here is the Yerkes dodson performance curve, which comes from kind of traditional psychological skills training. And it's basically a way to understand kind of how energy and arousal and performance are related. So we start to apply, how do things like training attention, mindfulness, this noticing the positive, how does that start to show up in applied way for an athlete to regulate their arousal, their energy level to be able to perform at their best? One thing to call out here that for me at least is very interesting is we in week five is when we get to some of the things that exist in traditional psychological skills training. So we're building a foundation of awareness of the internal state and skills to navigate that internal state before those traditional psychological skills are introduced, uh, which I think goes to show how like this work eventually as it scales can impact industries in big ways. And of course we finished the training, we got to wrap it up, right? Like, so we've done some learning. What, have, what does an athlete gain? What have they learned? Kind of what's their training plan moving forward? So inside the training, we do various types of practices. So one of them is I think of as base training. So in the metaphor of strength and conditioning for the mind, this is like getting in the squat rack. You don't get in the squat rack to become a squat rack hero. You get in the squat rack to develop certain muscle groups that can show up in the activities that you care about. So if we wanna train things like attention, mindfulness, appreciation, we can do practices like breath awareness, like Qigong, like appreciation practices. So these are five, 10 minute practices that we do together, and then they have access to do on their own. This is building those big muscle groups. And then we want to integrate them into our lives. We have integrated practices to be able to do that quickly. So those can be simple things like four, five, six breath. Uh, it can be something like one good thing. Uh, and the idea here is that for these athletes, they are simply waking up. They are, these qualities are there and this just spurs them to be felt in that moment. One thing I want to call out here too is something like a four, five, six breath, you know, has lots of cousins in this sort of training, like tactical breathing, this sort of thing. Uh, and, and those are wonderful, but those practices in, in this framework exist in something larger. We're training skills, we're developing these mental emotional muscle groups. They're not just simply standalone practices to regulate sympathetic parasympathetic nervous system. That's not a bad thing, but that exists inside of something larger. And then ultimately we want this stuff to show, to show up spontaneously, uh, just start to happen naturally. One, we recognize it when it happens. These qualities of having your attention be where you want it to be this stability in the midst of chaos are natural human qualities. So when they exist, when they come up in our life, we need to recognize them. Sometimes they just float away by recognizing they have some stability. And then also we can train to experience them more often. So we're doing both of those. So again, this is the you know six weeks we go through this training, athletes, coaches are participating in this. Uh, and then Drew will share some of the things that we found as a result of this training. All right, so like Chad mentioned, this is, this is an optional thing that some groups really take on and embed within their daily operations. Other groups haven't yet. So we're not, this isn't you know, randomizing individuals to a treatment or not and trying to control everything about it. We're sort of doing these things within the normal logistical framework of a working athletic department. So the way we look back at this 
was we had women's athletes that were introduced to this training at a particular point in time. And we have quality of life measures before that and after that for that group. And then we have quality of life measures for groups that have never been introduced to it. So what we're really doing is comparing sort of like the overall trend and the quality of life of the groups that were or were not introduced to this mindfulness training and sort of looking at whether or not the change afterward is different between them. So this is just showing the number of athletes that we're talking about, just to sort of point out the sizes of the groups. And then this is showing that same kind of like over time average and variability of the mental side of that quality of life measure that we have. And I've sort of just labeled where that mindfulness training happens. But if you just bucket everything before and after, that's the graph on the bottom that shows that the individuals who were introduced to that mindfulness training had this really sort of clear and obvious increase in the mental side of their quality of life in the time points afterwards with respect to mental quality of life. It's not technically truly significantly decreasing in the other group, but what that interaction term is doing is just comparing the change over time between the two groups. So what we're seeing is that the individuals that were introduced to the mindfulness in early 19 had a markedly greater benefit or increase rather in the mental quality of life that we were measuring compared to the groups that weren't introduced to it. If we look at the physical side though, it's really not very different. I think this is kind of interesting. Among these women's athletes, we don't really see a big impact on the physical side of quality of life, but it does seem to be associated with this benefit for the mental side. And then just to be thorough, we did the same thing looking at men's athletes that were or weren't introduced around that same time and did the exact same sort of analysis. And I think what's interesting about this is that if you look at the mental side, we don't really see a big difference but you do actually see a considerably bigger benefit for those athletes that participated in the training with respect to their physical quality of life. If you look at that graph kind of on the bottom right, for whatever reason, the individuals that were introduced to it happened to have lower quality of life beforehand, but you can see they basically kind of caught up to the other groups as a function perhaps of participating in this training. So interesting, perhaps, that men and women seem to have maybe a differential response that we're going to have to do a little digging into. But in both groups, you do see that the ones that participate in it seem to do better afterwards with respect to at least some portion of their overall quality of life. Um, and then this is just to dig a little bit deeper here. So most of the credit here goes to Kevin for the degree to which the women's volleyball team participates in the daily data collection that he does, which is really sort of amazing. They collect all sorts of information from their athletes day to day, and we've just sort of pulled out a little piece of it. On the left there, we're just sort of showing the overall compliance of this group with the daily data collection that they do and the number of people on the roster changes, but it's just to show that they are extremely compliant with this, which ends up meaning that a lot of the information we get from there is a really high fidelity and allows us to really pick up the sort of signals we're looking for. On the right there is just sort of looking over this particular academic year, how many of those volleyball athletes every day reported doing a mindfulness session, you know, before they were reporting the information. And it's just sort of interesting, I think it's sort of higher at different parts of the season. I've never mapped that onto their competition schedule or anything. But nonetheless, you see that the group is really good at providing data for us, but they're also increasingly more and more compliant and participating in the in mindfulness sessions largely on their own. And so what we can do with that is compare the well-being that they report on the days where they did or did not participate in a mindfulness session. So this could be part of a group. It could be individually. It could be interacting directly with Chad. We didn't differentiate those. But if you just look at their well-being on days where they did or didn't report performing a mindfulness session, it's a little sort of fuzzy up here, but basically it's showing that on the days where they report having participated in mindfulness, their mood is better, their muscle readiness is better, their total energy is le level is better, and then their overall readiness to train score is better. And what I think is interesting about this is if you do a little bit of statistical hand-waving here and you look at the at the ratings they give relative to the number of individuals on the team. So if we look at like the whole team average for some of these measures and how many of them did a mindfulness training that day, there seems to be a dose response. 
So the more sessions that they report doing, the better the overall mood is, the better the overall readiness to train score is. So maybe a little bit of suggestion that it's actually impacting some of these well-being measures and that there's even an aggregate effect where the more of them that do them, the better off the team looks as a whole. So I'll sort of leave that piece and then try and transition into some preliminary things that we've been doing around injuries. And I think the broader framing I try and put around this is that for me, clinically, as well as within research, and I'm not alone, we're really starting to recognize that injuries aren't just physical issues, that they affect the entire athlete and that there are a lot of knock-on effects of injuries outside of the joint or the tendon or the muscle that's impacted. And so we're paying more and more attention to how this influences athletes as a whole and thinking more and more about ways we can address some of these non-physical, if you will, consequences of being an injured athlete. This is just to highlight some of some of the work that's been done before me, this was a review from a few years ago that I think does this really well. And it's kind of how I imagine this as a clinician is that after an injury athletes, most of them are going to have some short-term psychological consequences, whether that's mood issues, changes in appetite, changes in sleep. Some of them unfortunately are going to go on to have persistent or worsening or even excessive symptoms. And so as a physician, my role, I think, within this framing is to try and identify who these people are so that we can intervene and reduce the risk of this progression. But as everybody here is going to appreciate, there are a whole lot of things that get in the way of this. There's a list here that I won't read, but basically this, the number one thing at the top that interferes with our ability to do this is that we still have a cultural stigma around mental health. That's just ubiquitous in Western society. We're getting better, I think, but we still have this pervasive stigma around mental health conversations. We're getting a lot of benefit, I think, from high-level athletes that are starting to come out and talk about this and normalize conversations around it. This is just my sort of effort to interject a brief soapbox stand to say we have to continue to work on this so that we can identify individuals early and reduce the risk of that progression. So if we think about like how psychosocial things influence outcomes, right? Injuries can have negative effects on the psychosocial outcomes directly, right? Injuries can influence your anxiety, your depression, your well-being, your quality of life. They may actually in turn ultimately undermine your return to sport. So this is, this is just sort of couching this in existing data that's been going on within sports medicine for a while recognizing that if there is an area where this has had a lot of attention, it's around ACL injuries. I think these are common enough that all of us have interacted with one of these in our lives, if not had one. And this is just to point out that when you look at the people who suffer ACL injuries and have them reconstructed, there is a large portion of them that never get back to playing sports. And some that do never get back to the level that they were at. Something on the order of about 40% of athletes don't get back after an ACL injury. And the overwhelming majority will tell you that the reason is fear of re-injury. They distinguish lack of confidence. For me, those are the same thing. Something like 90% of people who don't get back to sports because of psychological reasons, it's a function of fear of re-injury. So we frame this around this fear avoidance model. And I won't belabor this, except to say that it's starting to become clear, I think, to us in medicine that Injured people can deal with their injury without much fear of re-injury, without much anxiety around it, fully confront their rehab, fully return to sport without too much difficulty. But there are other individuals who will develop significant fear of re-injury and catastrophize over pain. This will interfere with their rehab. This will undermine their ability to be active, results in disuse, depression, and sort of feeds on itself. ACLs, we think of this way, that what really the issue is, is that if you are an injured athlete with an ACL, it isn't just about your knee. It isn't just about instability. It isn't just about swelling. You have an experience of what it's like to be an injured athlete, which is also about losing social connections, losing your identity as an athlete, losing all of the things that you tend to identify with that come with being a high level athlete and are lost for a period after your injury. And so again, there's some individuals that are going to manage that post-injury period without too much difficulty, fully engage in the rehab process, confront their return to activity and end up back fine. 
and others are going to get caught in this sort of cycle of anxiety and fear of re-injury that ultimately undermines their ability to return. So we're more and more trying to think about how can we go after that as a target? So not just let's work on landing mechanics, let's work on your knee strength. What can we do to address all of the things that we think interfere with your ability to return to sports that aren't your knee? And so just circling back to this review that we did, one of the other outcomes of this is that there is some emerging evidence that mindfulness training can reduce the risk of in-season injury. Um, so what we've done is sort of a preliminary look at this, again, recognizing that the women's volleyball team is tremendous at generating information that we can actually analyze. We were able to look at some of those same like well-being and mindfulness reporting measures, as well as the injuries that we saw within that group over the course of 2021. And so just to show it again in a different way on the left is the number of reported mindfulness sessions that they said they did day to day within the team. And on the right is the number of injuries that we had reported for that same group through the same time frame. So what you can then do with this is look at whether or not somebody had an injury following a time where they either did or didn't report having performed a mindfulness session. So you can look at what is the injury risk among individuals who don't report having done mindfulness session within the last day and those that do. This is a very sort of like preliminary exploration to try and see if there's any kind of signal within this. And this is a bit complicated at the bottom, but basically if you look at all injuries together, it suggests that the individuals who, are, who report having done a mindfulness session within the next day are about 5% less likely to report having an injury. Now that seems small-ish and the absolute risk reduction probably is, but when you think about that being an individual daily effect, if you do that for everybody over the course of a period of time, you're gonna be talking about a lot of injuries. Now, there is a potential for confounding things in here, right? There's lots of stuff I can't control for. It's very much kind of a preliminary exploration of it, but there's some suggestion here that we may not just be moving the needle on well-being, moving the needle on quality of life, Maybe we're actually connecting dots between behavioral interventions and injury risk, which is obviously a threat to any athlete's ability to perform. So last thing I'll try and touch on here before I hand it back to Chad at the end is one of the other outcomes from this is that an unanswered question is whether or not mindfulness really does play a role in injury recovery and this risk of re-injury that I was sort of touching on. And so just to sort of zoom out, of the athletic department here, we've started running clinical trials looking at whether or not mindfulness can actually help get people to the right side of this diagram. So rather than thinking about just this sort of physiologic things that get so much attention in rehab after injuries, we're actually starting to explore whether or not we can impact recovery, return to sport and even re-injury theoretically by undermining these psychosocial consequences that we think interfere with it. The issue for us, I think, working within an orthopedic department is that we don't have a chat. Sadly, we have real resource limitations. And so in order to try and overcome this in the kind of broader, scalable real world, we've started introducing this as a remote intervention. So as Chad mentioned, the Center for Healthy Minds on campus here is probably the international leader in this area. And along with a ton of work have also developed a software application that you can get on your phone and use remotely that does mindfulness training and some of the same sorts of facets that Chad was talking about. This is just one randomized controlled trial. It's been used in, there are several others. So we're basically incorporating this into a randomized contr controlled trial around ACLs to see whether just adding this remote intervention changes outcomes after ACL reconstruction the goals here, of course, are to see if we can improve psychosocial outcomes, see if we can improve return to sport, see if maybe even we can reduce the risk of re-injury, which is a pervasive problem after this injury. And then lastly, I'll just say that this isn't an ACL specific problem. There are lots of populations of athletes and young adults with orthopedic conditions where psychologic comorbidities really influence outcomes. I think this is true all the way down to kids 
that anxiety and depression and post-traumatic stress interfere with our ability to help get them better surgically. And so this, just as an example, is the sort of attention this is getting around hip arthroscopy, labral tears, and, and femoroacetabular impingement, I think, are becoming more and more recognized as a common cause of hip pain in athletes, certainly here as much as anywhere. But there's a lot of evidence that psychiatric comorbidities influence outcomes here, even among those that get surgery, that maybe even affects healthcare costs and opioid usage, which is a big issue within orthopedics. But no real studies about how behavioral interventions can improve outcomes. So we're basically doing the same thing around hip arthroscopy, just seeing whether if we incorporate mindfulness into the standard of care after surgery for these sorts of issues, do we improve outcomes, maybe even opioid use? Can these things actually improve pain and function and facilitate return to activity? So my sort of brief wrap up here is just to circle back and point out like we are going to be in the middle of a mental health epidemic for a long time. And this is going to influence everything about being an athlete within Western culture. That injuries and, and even things like prolonged illnesses, perceived poor performances, major life events, these all influence quality of life and mental health in athletes, not just as their own endpoints, but also potentially influence things like injury risk, performance, attrition from sport. Mindfulness, I mean, as we're talking about it, is a scalable intervention, right? It is low cost, it is low risk, it is something that you can readily distribute to lots of people, particularly when we're talking about doing it remotely, but it is exactly the sort of thing that would help us target the sort of outcomes that we think are mediating a lot of broader issues after injuries or even among athletes with mental health issues. And then lastly, we're starting to think that maybe this sort of intervention can improve outcomes after an injury, maybe even reduce the risk of re-injury, and this will be a big focus of what we're doing more broadly in the years to come here. All right, I'll hand it back. Sweet. That was awesome. Thanks, Drew. Um, so we wanted to spend just a couple minutes reflecting a little bit on, you know, for us, like, what does this mean? Uh, uh, and what might potential impacts of this be? So just a few reflections kind of from my end. One, I think it's really exciting that we have mindfulness and meditation data on this level of athlete. Uh, that's a gap in the research. So to have it at you know, a major power five institution is a, a major contribution in moving the work forward. Also, uh, really important, I think, to note that this work is preventative. This work is strength and conditioning for the mind. This is just embedded into overall training. And I think that's beneficial for a whole host of reasons, including what Drew was talking about with something like stigma. Uh, there's the stigma, we kind of evaporate a lot of that, right? When Kevin, the strength coach, says we're doing it, right? You know, when you know, Snee in the weight room says we're doing it, right? You know, when Coach Jones for the soccer team invites it in, like stigma just evaporates. It's just part of kind of how this training goes because this is about getting better, right? Athletes are really good at training to get better, right? It's typically training the body to get better. But of course, the mind and the body aren't two separate things. So we start to train the mind. Athletes understand that it's in the process of getting better, not just for performance as well, right? It's performance and well-being, which again, are not two separate things. These things are deeply intertwined. And to me, it's pretty friggin' exciting that we see impacts on things like injury, right? We see, you know, as Drew calls it, like these well-being measures. I'm just gonna name a couple of those again. We saw impacts on things like mood, muscle readiness, energy level, readiness to train. So when I talk to athletes and say like, as your training increases, does your mood get impacted? your muscle readiness go down, your energy level go down, your readiness to train go down. And they all say, yep, absolutely, right? And coaches, sport coaches, strength coaches are trying to keep people kind of at that edge, right? Well, this is a way to potentially mitigate some of those negative impacts, right? So they're able to continue to train, but not just train to the point of turning their bodies into these robotic machines, but also be happy, healthy people. Like we can be A plus high performers and live happy, healthy lives. And this training can be central to that. Um, I also think another reflection is, you know, and I love what Drew's talking about, you know, we're talking about some of the work we're doing at Wisconsin Athletics, which is a very select population of people training in a high performance way with lots of resources. But I think these findings can start to spread out to the rest of us, right? Uh, 
So uh, is everybody in this room, everybody on Zoom, would you like to have less likelihood of getting injured? Absolutely, right? You know, like as a 42 year old guy who's like, what are, like low back pain, all right, here we go, right? You know, like this is a thing. We can start to integrate this or, uh, or just embed it into all of our overall training, right? You know, you go to the gym, after you're, you know, cool down, you listen to a little bit of practice. So I think we can find it in these high performing, you know, athletic situations, but also the impacts can spread out well beyond that. And then it becomes, I think, a really, from my perspective in particular, like this amazing self-benefiting cycle between research and athletics. Like we know from all sorts of other intervention research outside of, you know, mindfulness and meditation, that there's a 17 year gap from intervention to impact in the field. So it gets published in scientific journals, all these, you know, PhDs read it, talk to each other at conferences, and then it doesn't hit the field for 17 years. Well, we can speed that process up. We can go from the findings are being published to this impacts training this afternoon. So we can speed that process up to, to impact things. Uh, and then of course, it, like from my perspective too, this raises a ton of questions that are gonna inform an ongoing field of study. So that when we look back, you know, we look back on a presentation like today and we say, man, we were just getting started. Uh, and we ask a whole bunch of questions that continue to, you know, amplify and our understanding of what, you know, this work can be like moving forward. Those are a couple of my reflections kind of when I think about like where we're going next, both on like the training and the research side. Drew, anything you want to? Yeah, I, I mean, I would echo all of that. I think for me, like what we do within within the athletic department is really, really enjoyable for exactly that reason. Like Chad was talking about time scales, just as an example, I put up that slide about the ACL randomized control trial we're doing. That's in a community population with all of the sort of, you know, logistical hurdles to overcome that you have when you're doing clinical academic trials. I had the first conversation with my co-PI, my orthopedic surgeon friend about doing this <clears throat> five years ago, we're not, we just recruited the third participant. You know, we started, we started recruiting like in the last couple months. It takes so long to get all of the things in place in order to do that sort of research and generate the funding to do it clinically. On the other hand, the sort of self-fulfilling cycle that we were talking about within athletics, shorts, like shortcuts all of that, right? So Chad and I got connected, I don't remember how long, but not that long ago, and we started putting our heads together and looking at some of these things. And now we're using the information that we've collected to form what we're doing next in such a short timeline. So it's, it's a really like satisfying and enjoyable way to actually do research because you can see the return so much more quickly. You can impact an athlete within their own career while they're at UW, whereas academic clinical trials, I'm not going to affect, you know, one of the 20 year olds in this study, it's not going to really impact clinical practice for maybe till they're 35. And the other point I would just highlight, which is a little bit off topic, but I spend a lot of time outside of my day job coaching young athletes. And I think the more time I spend around chat and around mindfulness, I'm just increasingly recognized in the last 25 years that I've been a soccer coach, I have poured like 99% of my energy into skill acquisition and you know decision making and fitness. But how little time do we actually spend training athlete minds? On some level, it's sort of like, if we do all these other things, all that poise and resilience and whatever will just come along for the ride. But I don't think that's true. I think they actually need to be trained just like we train everything else. And so as this sort of builds out and we start to recognize that we can train minds, it really does seem like the next kind of frontier of advancing, not, not just well-being, but, but performance and, and even reducing injury risk in a whole new way that has additive benefits to all the things that we've already been doing. So that's sort of my broader perspective on it. Which segues really nicely into this metaphor, which some of you have heard before. So 50, 60 years ago, elite athletes weren't lifting weights. They thought it would make them bulky, heavy, wear their bodies out, right? A little bit of science starts to point to the benefits. You know, a few athletes start to participate in this training, and now it is a multi-billion dollar industry that is embedded at every level of sport. And I think that what we're, we're talking about today is going to be on a similar trajectory, that we're going to have folks like 
Mumajan Mehta, middle, uh, starting middle linebacker for the Badgers, who's also a four-year meditator. Or Emma Jaskinick, Big Ten midfielder of the year, who said, I was so calm. I knew what I was doing. I was in the moment, and I scored the game-winning goal. That's the, mo that's the moment I knew I was meditating forever. So that anybody who's interested in winning athletic championships or whatever our pursuit is to get better in our own strands of life, you are going to want to include rigorous mindfulness and meditation training. And if you have a picture of yourself with a national championship trophy, you're obligated to show it, not my choice. <laughs> These are the rules, okay? So we appreciate it. Uh, happy to connect in whatever ways are helpful via that. Uh, thank you, we can have a discussion. Chad, I'd like to hear your experiences on how to enhance adherence to mindfulness training from athletes on my mind. Mm. Yeah, so how to uh, increase adherence to mindfulness training for athletes. So a couple of thoughts on that. So uh, one, uh, for folks who end up in positions like this, where they're teaching folks mindfulness and meditation, it's very easy to think that the way that other people are going to benefit from practicing is the way that I benefited from practicing, which of course is not true, right? So first we need to kind of like understand that, right? You know, like what are the attachments? What are the assumptions I'm bringing that I think people need to do in order to benefit? For example, uh, like in the meditation world, having a, a daily practice is considered a big deal, considered really, really important. Yet if we're seeing, you know, even in these data, that this isn't a daily practice where we're seeing these impacts, we're seeing it at much smaller levels of practice. So I think, what do we mean when we say adherence, right? We need to have kind of a measured understanding of what that is. And then also, I think it's really important that we, uh, I think it's a really bad idea to make people meditate, a terrible idea to make people meditate. I think it's a really good idea to expose people to what meditation is. So if we expose people to what it is, give them a little bit of practice, give them a little bit of the science, and then start to embed it into teams, then over time, when folks are ready to do a little bit more, then they can do a little bit more. So those are some of my So if I can piggyback here, and you can correct me if this metaphor falls apart on some level, but individually, I think this is kind of like exercise, right? If you have never done it before and you go out running, it feels bad. And the first time you really do sit down and become aware of how distracted you are and the sort of electrical storm that's going on with your thoughts it could be a little intimidating. And sometimes I think people hit that sort of initial resistance and struggle to keep doing it. But as you do it, you start to recognize the benefits and it becomes sort of self-fulfilling in kind of the same way that physical activity is, where as you get more physically fit, you start to see the benefits and you actually don't feel as good when you don't do it. So I think it becomes kind of reinforcing in the same way if you can get over that initial friction of how it feels a little weird the first times that you do it because it's a new experience. But if you're able to hang on and do it, you see the same sort of aggregate benefits that you see when you're engaging in something like exercise. I don't know if that's fair. Absolutely, yeah. With that um, strength and conditioning metaphor, thinking of like how much we've learned over the last whatever 40 years and how maybe people who were lifting weights 40 years ago or doing conditioning 40 years ago were doing a lot of things that technically was strength and conditioning but now we know that that's not optimal like what you're doing is not good strength and conditioning so when you talk about um meditation training um i'm imagining there's a spectrum of mental stuff that we, it sits somewhere in there, like you talked about, like everything from positive psychology, somewhere in the sport world, meditation training, um, spiritual stuff, people, it's meaningful to them, we talked about that. Um, how do you differentiate like that spectrum um, in your work? Yeah, I have something, you have something. Right? Can I say a little more so like, how? Like I would imagine there are other people who do meditation and they're kind of crappy at it. Like <laughs> they don't have good, they don't do it well, you know? And so how do yeah. you know so, it's good? Yeah, so where it's, does it sit in relation to other? Yeah, so it's a really good question. So I think part of what's happening here is um, in, this, in this work is, uh, you know, mindfulness and meditation is not a licensed 
profession, right? So anybody can just hang a shingle and say, I teach mindfulness, I teach meditation. We have no idea like what, you know, the differences between one provider and another. Uh, but the same thing was true 40 years ago for strength coaches. You could just say, hey, I'm a strength coach, you know, and do whatever you're doing, you know, in the back of the garage sort of thing, right? You know, and that's not the way the industry is anymore. So I think we're going to see that progression kind of happen over time. And some of the ways that I think are going to be important is what are the frameworks upon which the work is setting? So we can look to other, you know, whether it's, you know, traditional psychological skills training or, you know, some of the frameworks that are coming out of places like the Center for Healthy Minds, where we have kind of taxonomies of when we say meditation, what are the areas that we're talking about, right? You know, what are these kind of pulling from? So that we can start to kind of, you know, identify interventions that have certain qualities that lead to certain outcomes. Uh, but I just think we're, uh, we're early days in this work. So like quick, easy answers are not where we're at. And I think frankly, that's really good for this field is that we don't scale before we know the benefit of the work, right? We don't know how to implement it. So not knowing, I think, gives us some patience to try to understand a little more slowly how this comes to life. Some thoughts? Yeah, I, I have very little to add there, except that within the sort of research side of it, that is very much why we try to be as narrow about what it is exactly that we're evaluating. So Chad clearly is delivering a very systematic approach to this, and, and it's going to be consistent from one group to the next within, you know, broader clinical trialing, that's exactly why we leverage an existing uh, software application like the one that was developed on campus here is to make sure we are doing what we're operationalizing and not any number of things that fall under the mindfulness umbrella, depending on where you look, which could be like yoga versus Tai Chi or whatever. So we're very sort of clear about what it is that we're doing so that we can feel confident that the intervention is actually what's causing the change. And that if other people did something similar, they'd see a similar. Yeah, great question. So the question was the way for kind of athletes specifically at UW to get involved. Yeah, uh, let me know. Okay. <laughs> um, and so this is one of the things, you know, it could be just like a direct reach to me. And, you know, I talked earlier about, and I know you're aware of this, but just for others sort of listening, uh, the, you know, we have Forward 360 at Wisconsin Athletics. So I think anybody else who's interested in doing this work at other places, the importance of embedding the work into larger systems so that an athlete can say like, hey, how do I do this stuff? And they could ask, you know, the tr their trainer, they could ask the strength coach, you know, sport coach. And those are all easy ways to say like, yep, I can connect you with this chat guy. Yeah, absolutely. Please. Um, so how would you be struck by um, the differences in gender with quality of life and meditation? That, 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 that whole slide where, correct me if I'm wrong, but it was uh, meditation helps the women athletes for quality of life on the mental side, and then for the men, there was an increase on the physical side. Yeah. So, that, that really struck me as interesting. So I'm wondering, like, first off, if somebody who doesn't know about this metric or how you do that, like, what is it? I like, broadly, yeah. then, like, do you have any theories about, you know, given what you know about meditation or quality of life or the athlete or the athlete or something or gender, and like, why do you think that difference? Yeah. Um, so the, the first part there, so physical quality of life in this inventory is about asking think about things like pain, whether or not, uh, physical symptoms interfere with like daily activities, physical function broadly, which is a little different than like psychological quality of life, which is more sort of about the mental side of things. So I, it's purely speculative about why we see those gender differences. I will point out that for the women's side, we're, it was the ones who participated in the mindfulness were volleyball, and then the others were from other women's team sports. So, well, uh, I want to make sure I don't misstate, but I'm almost positive those were hockey, basketball, and soccer. But either way, so it was sort of women's team sports. So the physical side between those groups really didn't change very much. So to me, it, it wasn't necessarily that mindfulness was changing their degree of sort of physical limitation with daily activities, but it did seem to have a pretty big effect on their psychological quality of life. So the men's one is, is a little different because the participants are all football. So 
the and then the other groups were other men's team sports, but they're they don't have nearly the same sort of physical burden, if you will, less injuries, less even sort of like day to day soreness and the kind of things that might not restrict them from participating. So in that it's almost like you have more room for improvement maybe in that group and like it showed on the graph they kind of started with a lower level of physical quality of life and and if you know not to be too causal about it but it almost looked like the mindfulness just brought them back to everybody else so it could be that what we see is that in the male in the football team what we have is sort of the opportunity to improve their physical quality of life because maybe there is more of a burden of day-to-day -day kind of aches and pains that's sort of how I explain it in my head. I can't say for sure, but that's what I've come up with. I don't know. We've never actually talked about that. We haven't talked about it. I mean, the physical burden is something that I've thought about too, that that's maybe a part of why we see it. Uh, but my real first response is I have no idea. Uh, and that's a really interesting question that we need to investigate further. Um, and I remember the first time meeting with the volleyball staff and uh, Brittany Dildine, who's one of the assistant head coaches and is incredible in every single way, looked me square in the eyes. And at this point, I'd done the work with football and men's basketball and said, you will not treat these women any differently than you have taught the men you have trained with. And not that I was planning to do that anyways, but it was real clear, right? Like we're getting after it, like let's rock and roll sort of thing, right? You know, so from a training perspective, it's, it's absolutely no different. Uh, and then the last part is this is where I think it requires many people from different areas of expertise to think through this, right? Uh, so whether that's sport coaches, strength coaches, you know, sports psychologists, so many people to try to understand what these things are so that we can begin to identify some of those, you know, knobs and levers that, you know, may be impacting this. Thank you both so much. Really fascinating stuff. We'll look forward to following you along. Thank you all for coming. Thanks, everyone. Great session. On Zoom as well. Yeah, we're going next. Thank you guys. Yeah, thanks for.